We have 10 seconds. IVIG for movement disorders, CIDP, myasthenia, for small fibre neuropathy? Absolutely. One of the biggest issues with IVIG and autoimmune conditions is the types of providers that patients will categorically see and the level of understanding of how IVIG can be used coming from both perspectives. So typically patients with the conditions that are most appropriate for IVIG are seen by either neurology and very often they'll head to pain management. Yep. Sometimes rheumatology is also in there as well. So expand on the beginning when they start seeing patients and the pitfalls that you see going on with getting from point A to, to point C. Yeah, no, it's it's a challenging thing to navigate because I mean, let's, let's put it this way, sort of two different conversations, right? Neurology, they have a conception of who categorically and demographically patient-wise IVIG is suitable for. 99% of the time it's spot on. It's neuromuscular, it's CIDP, it's myasthenia, but they don't, they're not necessarily in the capacity that they could for patients with neuropathic pain. Somebody with neuropathy, um, the origin of their pain, what their pain stems from is inflammation. And so IG, immune globulin, among many other things, the wonder drug that it is, is an anti-inflammatory. And so if it suppresses the inflammation, in many cases, it lessens their pain. So a neurologist will look at the EMG and they'll say, okay, it's negative, but the patient still has peripheral nerve pain. So they'll either go down that rabbit hole of treating the pain or they'll send them to pain management. So for pain management, you know, you guys probably aren't too familiar with utilizing IG in general. Neuro is already for neuromuscular, but for pain, you know, that's, this is probably a uncharted territory and, and new frontiers and that's okay. That's my job is to go in to your office and say, hey, are you considering this therapy for your pain patients? It's an anti-inflammatory, it's an alternative to opioids. It addresses the root cause of the patient's pain, which is inflammation. Whether you're a neurologist that's used to using IVIG for neuromuscular, or you're a pain management doctor just looking for any remedy that you can for a patient that suffers with chronic neuropathic pain, you know, this is a conversation that I want to be interested in. It's really exciting to know that, you know, after doing this for seven years, I've gotten, well, we've gotten, this is my right, right hand person right here, left hand person right here, depending on which direction you're looking at the video. Anyway, so we've gotten literally hundreds of patients approved for this therapy off label, but the beauty of it is that, you know, we're sort of burdened by the task of the uphill battle of getting it approved off label through insurance. And if and when we do, we're seeing that three out of four patients really truly benefit, their pain lessens, their quality of life improves, their activities of daily living improve. It's a beautiful thing to know that there's that there are other options out there, progressive therapies like IVIG for this patient demographic. All right, so they have a patient come in and they have these symptoms. What is usually the first step? We'll take it from a neurologist's perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So in many cases, the neurologist will have already at that point have done an EMG. If the EMG is abnormal, then obviously IVIG is is a, is a pretty clear option. And that's the path of least resistance if we go with a large fiber neuropathy, because it's very much on label for that. If the EMG is normal, then the question is, are you willing to go further down that road of identifying if it's a peripheral small fiber neuropathy? In which case, then we would need to do a skin biopsy. Um, skin biopsy is, is a fairly non-invasive procedure. It's it's easier than an EMG without the tech, without the machine. It reimburses just as much as actually. So from the business side of things, that's obviously a benefit. But as far as working the patient up and in the best interest of the patient, it's a little three millimeter skin punch. And basically it just measures the nerve fiber density. So there's really two different conversations as far as working a patient up for small fiber. And it really depends on if you're in neurology or pain management. A neurologist in many cases will look at the EMG and if the EMG is abnormal, let's go down that path as far as IVIG is concerned, because IVIG is on label for neuromuscular and an abnormal EMG obviously shows that there's an abnormality with a large fiber neuropathy. For a neurology, one of the things that we could do as well beyond the EMG would be the skin biopsy. And so if you're willing to do the skin biopsy, that's a procedure that you could add to your arsenal of procedures you're already doing to work patients up. Typically, uh, the three sites are the upper thigh, the lower thigh, and the calf, and they're reimbursable through insurance. So for pain management doctors, it's kind of a different conversation because it's the first time they're probably considering utilizing IVIG. What's, I guess, 
fitting for pain management is in many cases, you're already doing spinal cord stim, nerve block, other, quite frankly, more invasive procedures. And so it's just another procedure that you could do for the purpose specifically of getting the patient worked up for IVIG. Okay. So after the EMG, what should they do next? Should they send in a referral to whatever specialty pharmacy, you know, they're, they're aware of or used to working with and what happens after that? Yeah. An abnormal skin biopsy, whether it be neuro or pain, basically is the ticket to entry to try to get a patient approved for IVIG. There's a referral form. The dosing is similar to how you would dose a neuromuscular patient. The diagnosis of CIDP for the pain management folks that aren't aware, it's chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. And so that's a very much on-label sort of signature diagnosis that IVIG is used for, essentially chronic Guillain-Barre syndrome. So we've established that IVIG is an anti-inflammatory, suppresses inflammation, and thereby lessens the patient's pain. Let's say you're at the point where you see a patient in clinic, whether you be a neurologist or a pain management provider, and you want to try IVIG. Where do we start, right? I would say a good start would be by just introducing the concept of utilizing the therapy to the patient in clinic. And so somebody like myself or Danielle or any other counterpart you have that does specialty pharmacy, uh, there are many of us pharmacies out there could potentially, you know, help with education. Obviously that's the point of this video is to create awareness and exposure to using IG for this patient demographic. But that being said, I would just see if the patient's open to doing a three to four day infusion, basically one week on three weeks off once a month, you know, one week and then three weeks off one week, three weeks off. And just like CIDP where it's the ice trial that Griffles did shows two grams per kilogram over five days every four weeks. And so that would essentially be how we dose and treat a patient with neuropathic pain aggressively high dose. At the end of the day, what it really comes down to is how do you feel? you know, a, a day, two days, a week, two weeks, potentially a month, two months later. On a scale of one to 10, what's your pain? How has your quality of life been impacted? And the patient will tell you flat out, juice is worth the squeeze and if they want to continue the therapy. And, you know, potentially it's one of those things, if, if it helps them, then it could become their maintenance therapy or in tandem with some of the other things they're already doing. Ketamine, Ketamine lidocaine, um, many of these patients are candidates for stims. I mean, whatever makes sense for the patient, it's case by case, patient by patient. But once the patient's on board with basically devoting the time that they would need to, to utilizing IVIG, then it's a matter of the workup. And so how specific you are in your dictation with tried and failed therapies, and that's a big one. Many cases are either on the beta blockers or they've been titrated to the max dose of the gabapentins, the neurons, the lyricas, the cymbaltas, their quality of life, how their condition affects their everyday activities of daily living. The more you can illustrate that picture, the more ammunition you can give us as a specialty pharmacy to get this therapy approved off label, obviously the better chance we'll have. One of the things that I'm sure your, your staff and your team will be happy to know is that that's our job is to get it approved. So you send over the referral, basically the script with the dosing and the frequency, any pre-meds, hydration, et cetera, and then your signature, right? And so that's that's a script right there. In many cases, unbranded is the way to go because so in so many situations in this world we live in of healthcare, it's the insurance companies that drive the decision-making and, and they have formulary brands that they choose. So it's the path of least resistance. But beyond that, the more specific you are in your dictation, copy their insurance card, demographics, and then of course your clinic notes, and then whatever lab. So if it's a large fiber patient with a CIDP, or myasthenia, or if it's a small fiber patient with an abnormal skin biopsy, the corresponding lab that matches the diagnosis. And then once we receive the prescription and all of the clinical that you feel is appropriate, we will then contact the patient. That's what I do on a daily basis. I will reach out to the patient, make sure they have a good understanding of the therapy, the side effects, the commitment, what you ordered, anything additionally that may be needed. And usually, for authorization, we can usually get it submitted anywhere from between 24 to 48 hours if we have everything up front that we need. And on average, most insurance companies, I'm, I've am i been seeing lately within five days, yeah. even less sometimes, sometimes longer, but yeah, it's the average. Yeah, I mean, so I feel like we're evolving in the world of healthcare and utilizing IVIG for this patient demographic. I feel like we're definitely advancing in the right direction. At this very moment, we're sort of fighting a war um, in the healthcare world as far as ways that we can get patients approved for progressive therapies off-label via their insurance. And so 
you know, that is the challenge is, is can we get them approved for the therapy in the event that we can? Yes, it's an expensive therapy. In many cases, if there are copays that are associated that the patient has, specialty pharmacy has copay waiver, you know, programs, financial hardship, um, the manufacturers of the drug, that's kind of step one is to look at if there's a copay assist program through the manufacturer. And then we could obviously look at if the individual specialty pharmacy has some sort of like a financial hardship, which most of them do. Ultimately, it comes down to, do we want to try and give a patient another option for a progressive therapy that can help them? Risk versus reward, it's either going to help them or it's not. IG is already in our blood and it's part of plasma. So adverse reactions are fairly minimal. A headache, rash, that's why we do hydration. That's why we do uh, Benadryl, you know, to sort of avoid those things as they're getting their first infusion. Some of the pre-meds will typically prescribe for a patient acetaminophen, Benadryl, ondansetron for nausea or stomach upset, sometimes a steroid, though most prescribers try to avoid that. Hydration is also very helpful. It just helps prevent and ward off the headache. That is the most common side effect. So this is something that I will go through with all of your patients. I'll also check all of the orders. Mike and I both go through the orders to communicate with you if we see something that maybe was missed or might streamline the process a little bit quicker. And then for reauthorization, ultimately, if we do successfully get your patients started on therapy, the authorizations can vary. Uh, some will give a three month authorization, some will do six and some will do a year. We always try and go for the year, the, the 12 months of authorization. At some point, at least we have it, even if they don't need it or they need to stop there. So can you think of anything else that we, uh, I'm sure we're missing a bunch of stuff, but. I mean, the way I see it is that I wake up every day and this is me not necessarily talking to them, but just being honest, like there's an option for people that most folks aren't aware of and that's okay, but that's why we're doing this to create exposure and awareness to the fact that there's another option for folks that suffer every day with chronic neuropathic pain. If we're able to even give some folks hope or the ability to feel less pain or have a better quality of life, then I would hope that as a healthcare community, we're sincerely looking at that as an option because over the course of seven years, I have about 300 patients that have truly benefited from IVIG. The only thing that's actually helped them when they've tried and failed everything else. And so at the end of the day, the worst that could happen is either helps them or it doesn't. And if they do deny the therapy for your patient, we are very, very good. We have it down to a science, actually, the appeal process. The first type of appeal is usually a peer-to-peer, -peer, which if, if your patients get denied, we will communicate with you whether a peer-to-peer -peer is an option. We will set that up for you. And usually that is the best chance of getting a denial overturned is clinician to clinician conversation. And then after that is a first level appeal, second level appeal. When it gets to the external appeal level, that's what we're getting kind of, of nervous. That is the point where it's it's been a while and the insurance company, for whatever reason, is just not satisfied with with what we're presenting. And that's not to say that if we get to that point that that's the end of the road, it's just um, kind of resetting and pivoting moment. External appeal is, is uh, as many of you know, unless you're gonna present something new and profound to insurance, they're most likely just gonna deny it. If they do deny the external appeal, now we're just holding that patient to at least six months for trying again. So it almost make more sense to not go down that road and then to kind of huddle up, pivot. <laughs> and then to submit a new authorization with updated clinical from a more recent visit to try again. All right, with that, if you have any questions, drop it in the comments, or you can email me at danielle at lucidmed.com. I will link all resources in the description below, anything I think or we think that might be helpful to you. And that's, that's gonna do it. Hopefully we've answered some of these very common questions today. It's very exciting to be talking about another option for folks that desperately need more options. And so we appreciate the fact that you're interested enough to consider an alternative therapy for patients of yours that, that really need more alternatives. Stay, Stay healthy, healthy and lucid. Or, okay, let's see. You got it. Re, you know, recalibrate. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. So I'm on the medications and then pain management. Um, but I mean, we could make it for both. Let's just make it for both. Let's, just, let's broaden the horizons. We can we can say for that and for that. You know, whether you be this or that kind of thing. Okay. So explain that to me. So I would just say like something along those lines. I, I, I'm just going down with that. I'm literally just going with that. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> Listen, guys. We need you to listen hold on <laughs> my dog I'm, still, I, I'm just sitting there I'm thinking like am I still talking and like in my head I'm like I'm like oh, it's like an outside of body experience I'm like yeah I'm like watching myself like, what the f is he talking about right now does he even know what he's talking about okay, okay. anyway um back up the wine got to me there um I had a rewind effect <laughs> no, it's all good. I, I, I like that it's raw footage. Um, here. Hold on, hold on, hold on, pull it back. Where the fuck am I going with this? <laughs> Does this happen to you a lot? Yes. Wow. You have no idea. Wow. Editing is my best friend. No, no, it's it, it's funny though, because like, I'm, I was just thinking about something, and like, I'm thinking about the next thing I'm going to think about, and then yep. I lose when I'm crap. That's why I usually have a teleprompter. Really? I put the really, whole really straight from the cuff here. That's um. Oh yeah. So let me let me just do you one more time because mm -hmm. I feel like I could. Yeah. I, I need to slow down and simplify. Is basically. Uh, wow. What the hell was I just thinking now? Oh my god. Um. <laughs> so it was that. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So. And then once we receive the prescription and all of JMO. 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 It's okay. It's okay. Buddy, come on. It's okay, beans. Come on. It looks like a bean, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. right. Just one more. You know, many patients. <laughs> it's okay. That was the perfect time for him to do that because I have like indigestion from this behind. It's really good, but like, like it's, it's got me a little nice bud. Yeah. That. I'm red blind. Um, <clears throat> so last thing we're going to do is take a few pictures that I might use in the thumbnail. Yeah, cool. Sounds good.